I'm JJ and welcome to this recording of a scenario playthrough of the attack by Admiral Collingwood on the Combined Fleet's line at Trafalgar using the Age of Sail rule set War by Sail, written by Thomas Jensen. I started playing War by Sail uh, this time last year. Um, and I was really attracted to them um, by the really interesting detailed gunnery component that Tom Jensen had built into the rules, as illustrated in his video clip that you can see um, uh, as an attachment to the War by Sale page uh, for buying the rules at War Games Vault, and I'll put a link to that at the bottom of this uh, recording. Um, that said, um, I've made a few changes and I included my own randomised activation, which you can see the chits in the uh, shot above, to, to uh, incorporate that aspect of play. So this isn't going to be a demonstration of how to play War by Sail, um, but rather a demonstration of, of the game with incorporating my changes around an historical scenario um, to see uh, how well they'll actually play. And um, just to give you an impression of the collection in action. Okay, so the scenario we're going to be looking at is the uh, Warlord Games Black Seas scenario, the Leeward Line, recreating the attack of Cuthbert Collingwood's Leeward Column on the combined line of the Franco-Spanish fleet at Trafalgar. So here you can see the scenario set up on the table with the combined Franco-Spanish fleet line closest to camera, uh, with their frigates uh, in, in the rear closest still, um, ready to pass on signals and uh, rescue any damaged ships. And bearing down on them is Admiral Collingwood's British um, column, led by his flagship HMS Royal Sovereign. The five ships immediately opposing the British column are led by the Spanish 112-gun three-decker Santa Ana, the flagship of uh, Spanish Admiral Lava. Behind him are three French 74s, the Forgo, the Pluton and the Algeciras. The Algeciras being the flagship of Admiral Magon, who is leading the second division of the squadron of observation at the rear of the uh, combined fleet line. And behind that ship is the Spanish 74-gun Bahama. Inward of those five ships are two other ships, the 84-gun L'Andomptable, uh, closer to the Santa Ana, and behind her, the 74-gun Spanish Monarca. Some authorities suggest that uh, this placement was deliberate in an attempt by Villeneuve to anticipate Nelson's attack by blocking off gaps in his line with ships in a follow-up line. Um, that's the charitable reading of the situation. I think it more likely perhaps that the Franco-Spanish fleet was probably unable to get itself into a proper line to uh, present as many guns as possible and so um, adopted the formation that it could on the day. Um, at the back, you will see the Trafalgar Companion, written by Mark Adkin, who was published during the Bicentenary celebrations. Um, if you are interested in doing anything around the Trafalgar Campaign, and certainly any of uh, Nelson's other battles, that book is a goldmine of information, and I would really highly recommend getting a copy. Um, the, there are copies still available secondhand. It's not cheap. Uh, I was very fortunate to get mine secondhand at the list price it was back in 2005. Um, but uh, it is really, really useful and it's a reference I'm going to be using uh, while trying to recreate this action and um, making some references to uh, comments from uh, uh, people that actually fought in this actual battle. So, um, yep, Trafalgar Companion, very, very much uh, a resource that's worth getting hold of. Hi, OK, so um, let's uh, get the game rolling. As I said at the beginning, I don't intend to give this, make this into a uh, how to play War by Sail um, presentation. Uh, Tom Jensen's done an excellent job showing that in his own uh, video, which I mentioned is on War Games Vault. So what I intend to do here is just to um, go through the moves on this scenario and maybe try and illustrate some of the key points and what I'm trying to model from the, um, <clears throat> the historical accounts of the fight. So, um, just referring to the um, uh, to Mark Atkins' Trafalgar Companion, um, the um, the final approach onto the uh, the line by by uh, Collingwood and the Royal Sovereign is, is described uh, described thus: Royal Sovereign, the first British ship to come under effective fire, did so at 11:40 a.m. 
At roughly the same time, more than two miles to the north, the lonely HMS Africa began her duel with the enemy van, followed some 20 minutes later by the victory. But these both these flagships led their divisions. The Royal Sovereign was under effective fire for some 35 minutes and the victory for 25, the time it took to cover the final three quarters of a mile to the enemy line, when they were most vulnerable to he heavy uh, fire without being able to respond effectively. The enemy's objective was to cripple the approaching ships by cutting stays or rigging and bringing down yards or even masts, thus rendering the ships unmanageable before any melee took place. During these 20 minutes, both leading British ships suffered damage and casualties, but their ability to reach the enemy and fight was not seriously impaired. Um, so the question that that posed to me when looking at the scenario was, um, I wanted to try and replicate some of that fire coming in from the combined line. So we've basically got about two moves before the ships get to this point where um, the combined line is trying to uh, knock down uh, British masts. So what I did was just to um, allow for that effect was to roll a d6 against each of the British ships on the approach with a 1 determining that um, one of their mast sections had, had been down on the, on the approach in um, and the only ship that uh, was effectively um, hit to an extent was HMS Culloden here at the rear of the uh, British line so she's got a um, I've just put a sail marker just to remind me and I've marked up her sheet so that as we go in on the approach um, she's taken some damage the other British ships obviously didn't so um, the note in the uh, log from um, Collingwood's um, uh, so, uh, uh, HMS Sovereign notes that they did open fire. He issued an order just before they penetrated the line at about 12.15 to open fire, basically to uh, relieve his gunners who'd been told to lie down on the upper decks until they crossed the enemy line, or just rather until they'd been ordered to stand and fire. So uh, he ordered them to fire just as they approached, um, with a reference to maybe creating smoke to help cover them as they, uh, they came in on the final approach. So I've modelled that. Um, so going to the chip draw, um, I've already drawn some chips. So I, I first of all drew uh, the red move British chip. So the British ships have all moved forward. Um, in my adaption here, they're all moving at their full speed plus a D6. So the Royal Sovereign barrel along uh, with a, a five added to her run. Um, uh, top speed of uh, six inches and um, uh, I didn't particularly want her going right up uh, bow onto the, um, the broad side of the Santa Ana so um, you can spill um, up to a quarter of your move spilling the sails so you can lose a quarter of your move up to the nearest inch so um, she shed about uh, uh, um, two inches of movement just to put her where she was um, and all the other British ships uh, moved accordingly and it's obviously broken up their nice ordered approach. Uh, but as you can see, they've already started to make turns in towards the combined line to uh, penetrate those gaps. So that's starting to happen. <clears throat> to replicate the fact the Royal Sovereign opened fire, the next chit out was in fact the red British fire token. Um, I did contemplate holding that, um, but looking at the situation that they weren't going to be able to penetrate the line just at this moment, um, I replicated Royal Sovereign opening fire with our four 12-pounder bow chasers, of which three hit, um, but with a structure rating of six on the Santa Ana, uh, that barely scratched the paintwork. So um, I put the smoke there for effect. The bow chasers have opened fire, um, but uh, they, they, uh, they really didn't do very much at all. Um, in addition to that, we have to assume, because I've taken damage checks all along the British column, that the combined fleet ships have been firing on the approach. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to test for each of these ships as they uh, have the opportunity to fire back themselves to see how many of their guns have reloaded and are, able, and are capable of firing on the British uh, line as they, uh, on the British column as it approaches. So I'm going to do that, and then we'll come back and we'll uh, we'll see how uh, how the damage looks at the end of the um, Franco-Spanish fire. Okay, so um, that's the end of the uh, first move. 
all the uh, chits have been drawn out the bag. So the uh, combined lot fleet have had their fire, return fire and their movement. Uh, as you can see, things haven't changed dramatically. The uh, uh, ships of the combined fleet have generally crept thought forward by about an inch. Uh, the frigates have gone a couple of inch with their, their um, uh, box hauling into the um, sorry, close hauling into the wind. So it's not, they're, they're, they're not really doing very much in terms of moving along. Um, but we have had some firing, as you can see. So the three um, lead ships of the combined fleet have opened fire. Um, I diced to see um, how many of the, the crews aboard each of the ships had managed to reload in time. So to give you an example, the um, Santa Ana at the uh, front there had 13 36 pounders available, but she only managed to reload five in the time to open fire. Likewise, 16 24 pounders, she only managed to reload three of those. Um, so all in all, um, she did rather well actually, managed to inflict 26 damage points on the um, Royal Sovereign as she's coming because it is rather close range now. She's at about five inch, so she's well within carronade range. And 26 points worth of damage inflicted um, a crew casualty, and she also managed to um, cause some sail damage. Um, so, uh, so yep, so she's, she's uh, performed rather historically. Um, the forego coming up behind, I opted to put her fire onto the uh, Belle Isle. Again, she had to reload, but the... Um, the French obviously come out slightly better in terms of their um, reload capability, their crew training slightly better. Uh, but out of 13 36 pounders, she managed to get five reloaded, but she hit with four of them. Uh, 15 18 pounders, she got six of them reloaded, and she managed to hit with five of them. So the, um, the Belle Isle at the end of that uh, round of fire um, suffered one sail damage. And then the final ship to fire. Uh, was the um, Pluton, I think that is. Mm -hmm. Yes, Pluton. That's Pluton firing. So she aimed her fire at the Mars coming in, slightly longer range. Um, she managed to reload five of her 13 36 pounders, six of her 15 24 pounders, and she got half three of her, three of six of her eight pounders reloaded. And she managed to inflict 22 points on the Mars, which caused uh, a crew casualty and a sail damage. So fairly representative of the sort of stuff that these ships were probably getting whacked with as they were getting into the uh, more effective gunnery range. But of course, the British broadsides are reserved and we now have the next move to go with those gaps looking very, very inviting uh, for some of these British ships to start charging through and uh, unleashing uh, stern rakes as they pass. Stern and bow rakes, by the looks of it. So um, let's press on and see what happens in turn two. OK, so um, this is the situation at the end of turn two. And um, I can honestly say this is quite an interesting setup now because uh, we are really um, getting uh, stuck in some close engagement here. Um, so first off, we have the Royal Sovereign here who has come through and pierced the uh, combined fleet line. The British fire token came out as the first token, so she was able to reserve her fire um, as she passed through to be able to do a stern rake and a bow rake on the Santa Ana and uh, forego, uh, respectively. Um, as you can imagine, that was a fresh broadside, um, probably double shotted as in the original engagements, um, and uh, a lot of damage uh, was caused with. Um, two structural hits and a crew casualty on the Santa Ana and two structural hits and uh, a crew casualty on the um, forego uh, which also caused two critical hits um, one of which caused another crew casualty on the forego and the other one started a fire you can see there's a fire raging there on the uh, on the model um, and then she uh, swung round in between to get uh, broadside on to uh, the Santa Ana, placing herself between um, the Spanish flagship and Land Omptable, the big 84 gunner French ship covering her. So that's going to be an interesting uh, scrap, I think, as, as was in the original battle. Again, likewise in the original battle, um, we've got the 74 gun Belle Isle. Uh, didn't quite manage to match the Royal Sovereign for speed. 
uh, Royal Sovereign barreled on through at 12 inches. She got the maximum speed she could, only nine inches on the Belle Isle, uh, which meant that she could squeeze her nose into the gap following the flagship, British flagship, but didn't quite have an angle on the Spanish triple decker to put in a, uh, a broadside on her. And so um, engaged in a, um, a close range broadside with Forgo. Poor old Forgo was uh, going to get another beasting on the way in. And um, she inflicted um, another two crew casualties, um, plus, um, sorry, another crew casualty, plus another two structural hits. Um, and she also caused a fire critical hit as well. So, um, so Forgo was in a desperate state at that stage. Uh, the Forgo later on in the turn managed to get um, one of the fires put out, but with uh, three crew casualties, she's one off of, of being listed as heavy casualties. So that's a lot of, uh, lot of um, men to have lost. And she's also suffered four structural hits. So she's only two away from being in a stricken condition. So really badly battered. She ended up having to take a morale test against that and um, not surprisingly uh, failed the morale test and is barely hanging on with her crew in a wavering condition, um, which we've, uh, which you can see, is, well, I might be able to see that. I've marked it on the, on the base. Um, one of the other critical hits, uh, the, sorry, the critical hit fire uh, when tested, they weren't able to put it out and it get, went on to cause some sail damage. So the rigging on the forego is also on fire. So, um, yeah, I think uh, very close to striking there, uh, the forego probably won't su survive another battering once the belly all passes through. But it all depends on how the, uh, the next turn uh, unfolds. Then uh, the third British ship coming up to the uh, line um, was the Mars, HMS Mars, Captain Duff, looking to try and squeeze in between the forego and uh, Le Pluton. Um, didn't quite close the range to um, get into the gap itself and so um, let rip with a close range broadside onto the um, forego which uh, resulted in uh, sorry on the pluton which resulted in two structural damage and a crew casualty so that's that's severe severe damage um, and also caused another critical hit on the uh, pluton which resulted in a fire uh, and that fire wasn't put out uh, so um, that's that's continuing to cause uh, extra damage to the ship. Um, and then further on down the line here, we've got the um, flagship of Admiral McGon of the uh, Observation Squadron. Um, and uh, obviously he was quite keen to try and slow down the approach of uh, the other British 74s that are approaching the uh, combined line. And uh, let rip on the... Um, uh, that was on the tunnel. I say let rip, it was a fairly desultory uh, broadside, but uh, it did manage to cause a crew casualty on the tunnel. Um, so, um, yeah, they're inflicting some uh, little bits of damage on the way in, but these British broadsides, when they come in close, can be quite devastating. So, uh, all to play for in um, turn three um, with the... Uh, the combined fleet, at, certainly at the head of its line, having taken a bit of a battering. It's going to be interesting to see whether the uh, Land Omptable can make a, an impression on the Royal Sovereign uh, before the Belle Isle gets through and hopefully comes to the suck of the uh, British flagship. Um, so we'll see how that unfolds. Hope you've enjoyed this first video looking at the Leeward Line scenario and I will carry on the action in the second part of this uh, video. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to know more about the uh, ships featured in this uh, game or anything to do with the Age of Sail collection, plus all the books and modelling materials, then may I suggest you pop along to JJ's Wargames Blogspot.